And a special hello to you, uh, those of you watching on the webcast, and those of you in the future who will be watching it on film. I'm David Biet. I'm director of the Canada Institute, and I'll introduce my colleague Jennifer Turner right here in the middle. Um, she directs the China Environment Forum, and she's going to serve as moderator today, and she's always enjoyable. This is, I think, the fifth or the sixth program that Jennifer and I have done together um, over the last five or six years. And as we joke, both countries begin with C and end with A. Um, but more seriously, uh, China needs resources for its booming economy, and Canada has resources to provide, and we've been looking at various aspects of those through the years. A little bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar with, with, with the Wilson Center. The Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars was founded in 1968 by an act of Congress as the official memorial to the 28th president, our only president with a PhD. At the center, we build a bridge between the worlds of academia and public policy to inform and develop solutions to the nation's problems and challenges. Canada, and certainly the United States, have been concerned about foreign investment. One only has to look at BHT Billiton's abandoning its proposed purchase of Canada's Potash Corporation, or the fuss several years ago when uh, CNUC was looking at Unical. Today's panelists will give us some insight into what's going on regarding Chinese investment in the energy industry in Canada and the United States. But first, let me do a little bit of advertising. The Canada Institute and some fellow programs at the Wilson Center will be doing a program on Arctic <coughs> energy on Thursday, July 12th. Stay tuned. And a little bit of housekeeping. We have an overflow room on the sixth floor, right up the stairs, straight ahead. And our band of trusted interns will shuttle questions from the overflow room to the moderator, and you can still see what's going on. Um, <clears throat> you won't be next to people, but you'll get all the benefits of being there, and you can get your question answered. And if you get claustrophobic in here, you could flee upstairs as well. And it may be a little bit cooler. Emergency exit is right out the door to the left, past the washrooms. We and say this since the earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> and this is being a webcast, um, so please wait for microphone to um, speak up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. I was told I was supposed to be entertaining, so. Hey, welcome to, uh, to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Just real quick, the China Environment Forum. We're, we're a teenager here at the Wilson Center. We're 14 years old, or almost 15, actually. And uh, we, uh, I love partnering with Canada, my Canada colleagues. And, um, but we, we tend to bring together government, NGO, business, and researchers around the world focused on China's energy and environmental issue, issues. I've done a lot on the water energy confrontation, but the, the, the issue of Chinese investment in North America has become a bigger topic. And look at all of you here. It must be a bigger topic. You all showed up. Or we have really nice coffee. I don't know which. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going to. And so I'm, I've asked these four smart guys up here to be succinct in their presentations today. And I'll be even succincter with the bios because you have them. But I should note at least who you are, right? Jeff. Yeah. Got Jeff Kucharski here from Alberta Energy. He is currently the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Strategic Services Division for Alberta Energy. He's had a lot of senior positions. He's hung out in five ministries, three secondments in the, to the private sector, and also the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. In your, in your, with your international trade hat, you tend to focus a lot on Asia, which means a lot on China. That's why we invited him. He has his hand on the pulse of what's going on in terms of regulation of oil and gas in Alberta. So, smart man. He's going to be starting us off today, talking a little bit about, you know, what's Canada, China, the oil waltz, the dance, the tango, <laughs> whatever you all do up there. Um, second, we've got uh, Adam Lusenko from the Rhodium Group. Most of you know they're the, that, uh, that shop up in New York that does economic research, but he's hanging out here in the outback of D.C. Disgustingly fluent in Chinese, but we won't go on that. Um, he's uh, focused a lot of his research on global trade and investment, and um, is particularly active in the Rhodium Group's China Investment Monitor, which tracks China's FDI projects in the U.S. And he's going to do this great job here. You know, a lot of times when you read in the paper about, you know, the Chinese are coming, right? You know, but well, what does this mean in terms of Chinese investment in these energy sectors? But he's going to put it in the bigger context of what's happening with China's FDI and the different types of energy. And then giving us hopefully a little bit of rampant anecdotalism, because that's good. By the third speaker, you want that. Um, he's going to be talking to uh, Bo Kong, who's over at SAIS. He's, he's, one of the, he's the, ener the China energy guru over there. Um, he's going to be giving us some examples of Chinese investment in the U.S. shale gas sector. He can talk more broadly. Again, we're going to go quick through the presentations so you inquisitive people can ask them lots of difficult questions. Um, Bo Kong, besides hanging out at SAIS, in their energy resource environment program. He wears lots of advisory and scholarly hats at private sector and, um, and research institutions in China and the United States. 
And last but not least, Wen Kong, Wen Ran Jiang. Yeah, yeah. He used to be one of our scholars here for the summer. He, he's a fun guy. He comes here lots. <laughs> Absolutely. He'll be introduced. You should just you should just like run the program here today, Wen Ran. <laughs> um, he's been the project director of the Canada China Energy and Environment Forum and its annual conference since 2004. So in some ways, you're almost like my counterpart in Canada, right? <laughs> right? Almost. Um, been a special advisor on China to the U.S. Canada based Energy Council. And he's also been advising the Alberta Energy folks, right? You, you, you hang with him. Uh, we do. <laughs> and you've now admitted it publicly, so yeah, we've got to watch this. Um, he, he, he wrote a book. I, he's, the only, he's the last book I will allow, allow to use the word dragon, The Dragon Returns, Canada and China's Quest for Energy Security, and doing another energy security book coming up on China. So he's going to be our closing pitcher, filling in the gaps, but in many ways kind of giving us the counterpart to what Adam and Bokong talk about Chinese investment in the U.S., you know, rampant anecdotalism, right? All right, Jeff? All right. You can be more serious. OK. But or not. Here you go. <laughs> Your 15 minutes of fame here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, uh, thank you, too, David, for uh, the uh, invitation. It's a great privilege for me to be here. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to the discussion later. Um, so I'll get right into it. My, my presentation today will focus on the strategic imperative for Canada to undertake our own pivot, if you will, to Asia and China in particular, and the role that Chinese investment is playing and will likely play in the future. I'll also outline some of the challenges and considerations that we face as we move forward in developing a strategic engagement with China on energy. First, let me give you a quick sense of where Canada sits in terms of global incremental supplies of energy liquids. The IEA sees future liquid fuel needs being largely met by OPEC, biofuels, and unconventional oil. This graph uh, shows new production or loss of production from 20 2010 levels, so it's incremental. Canada's baseline oil production in 2010 was 2.8 million barrels per day, of which 1.6 million barrels per day was oil sands. Based on IEA projected incremental production, total Canadian production is forecast to reach 5 million barrels a day by 2035, reflecting rapidly increasing oil sands production and lower conventional production. By comparison, industry sources expect total production will reach 4.7 million barrels a day by 2025, with oil sands increasing to 3.5 million barrels a day by 2020, so essentially oil sands doubling over the next uh, roughly 10 years. In terms of, oh, okay, we've got animations going. In terms of poly policy context, I tend to characterize North America currently as an energy island. That's because for the most part, we are disconnected from global oil and gas export markets. And therefore, the price differentials between WTI and Brent mean that we're failing to realize the world price for our energy commodities. This is very costly to jurisdictions such as Alberta, and it means tens of millions of dollars in foregone uh, revenues. Secondly, for Canada, the United States uh, is and will continue to be of vital importance as a market for Canadian oil and gas, but the reality is that you are our only customer, and that fact creates risks for Canada. Those risks include economic, uh, as in lower demand related to slower economic growth here in the United States, political risk, as in the Keystone XL decision, and environmental risk, for example, should climate change policies or other regulatory changes in the U.S. discriminate against heavy oil from Canada. As you well know, in the U.S., um, we're seeing increased domestic production from tight oil in plays like the Bakken as well as lower growth in energy consumption. This graph uh, shows that uh, U.S. net import requirements narrowed to 22% in 2010 and are uh, projected to narrow even further to 13% by 2035. These are obviously good trends for the United States, but they do mean that we in Canada may face growing competition from U.S. internal supplies and reduced demand for imports. On the other hand, it may be that new crude oil supplies coming into production in North America, including oil from Canada, will replace other imports, especially from the Middle East, reducing the U.S. reliance on these foreign imports. 
Some energy analysts predict that by 2016, the U.S. may not be importing any sweet crude uh, from uh, the Middle East. Canadian heavy oil and Bakken oil would uh, potentially displace this. In any case, based on forecasts of future oil sands production and North American pipeline takeaway capacity, we estimate, and we've done some work with uh, Wood McKenzie on this, that Western Canadian heavy crude supplies will outstrip uh, pipeline capacity by as much as a million barrels of, of oil a day by 2020 or thereabouts. So obviously that would mean we need to find a home for those additional barrels. So with that supply scenario in mind, where are the markets for this increased production and what does the current and future state of those markets suggest? Let me reiterate that the U.S. is and always will be uh, Canada's closest friend and most important trading partner, including and especially for energy. This must always be a top priority in our view. But the Keystone XL decision was a mindset changer for Canadians. The refusal or the delay in the KXL approval caused the lights to go on amongst Canadians who until that point had always taken for granted that the U.S. would be a given for our energy exports. This in turn gave the Canadian federal government the opportunity to turn Canadian uh, public's attention to alternative markets in Asia and particularly China. I shamelessly borrowed a word from your own lexicon and applied that word pivot here because I think it describes the change in attitude for us very well. But Canada's strategic pivot is different than the U.S. version in that it is by and large an economic one in nature. But I do believe that for Canada it's no less significant in terms of our longer term engagement with Asia. So why Asia and specifically why China? As you can see here, I've thrown up a lot of uh, perhaps interesting factoids about expected growth in China's energy demand, and you all will have your own and have seen many of these before. IEA stats show in 2009 China accounted for 17.3% of global energy consumption. Uh, IEA's World Energy Outlook in 2011 called for China, uh, what's now the largest world energy consumer, to consume nearly 70% more energy than the United States by 2035. IEA also projects China will account for about a third of global incremental energy demand over the period of 2010 to 2035. So a lot of growth, uh, much of that will be in hydrocarbons. Uh, of course, renewables will continue to increase, but uh, demand is obviously um, moving uh, strongly. Demand from China and the rest of Asia will be critical to Western Canada's economic future. We expect, and the Chinese have given us every signal, that the anticipated growth in energy trade, predicated on, com on uh, completing necessary infrastructure to tidewater, will lead to a much increased pace of investment in Alberta. So let's look at a little more closely at some of the investments uh, that uh, Chinese companies have made in Canada in the last five years. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that these most recent investments by China, while significant at around $20 billion in total over the last five years, are still dwarfed by the existing investments by U.S. and in European energy companies in the Canadian energy sector. Most of these investments have been made in Western Canada, principally in Alberta. Still, these investments from China are small relative to the potential investment capital that could flow if our relationship develops further and challenges are overcome. China's Ambassador Zhang visited uh, uh, Calgary uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I went there to, to listen to him, and he made some interesting points. Our pr Prime Minister's visit in 2009 marked the turning point in improving bilateral relations, and this was followed up by his return to China in uh, March of this year. Government officials from both sides now meet annually to discuss all areas of the relationship, and we're working to enhance the energy dialogue in particular. Joint studies agreed to after the exchange of visits by the two leaders are showing a high degree of complementarity between our two economies. In February 2012, 
the visit uh, or March saw uh, two important agreements, a foreign investment protection agreement, or FIPA, and a uranium agreement. Chinese energy um, state-owned enterprises have set up offices now in Calgary, and the China Investment Corporation now has its first North American office in Toronto. These companies have been complying fully with Canadian laws and regulations and are keen to become accepted as members of the energy community in Calgary. Having said that, support for Chinese investment amongst the broader Canadian public is somewhat divided, and so there is a need to address public perceptions, and China and Canada will have to pay more attention to this. The federal government has a process, as you may know, for reviewing significant foreign investments as mandated by the Investment Canada Act, and I will outline briefly how this works. Currently, any proposed foreign takeover, 51% or more, of a Canadian company is evaluated to determine whether there's a net benefit to Canada in terms of employment and other factors. Another uh, factor or criteria was added in 2007, and that was um, could the transaction be injurious to Canada's national security? Now, although that term has not been well defined, the criteria has been used only once. The Minister of Industry recently announced that the threshold for triggering a review will be raised gradually from $330 million, which it is now, to a $1 billion over the next four years. I will note that the vast majority of investments into uh, Alberta's oil and gas sector do not require federal approval. Since 2008, there have only been two rejections. One, McDonald Detweiler for reasons of national security. The other was BHP Billiton. Uh, proposed takeover of Potash Corporation uh, failed to pass the net benefit test. So far, no Chinese state-owned enterprise transaction has been refused. Um, in this slide, I've tried to summarize some of the key motivations that Chinese organizations have for making investments in Canada. One in particular I would note is the fact that the world's oil reserves uh, not controlled by OPEC or Russia, of the world's oil reserves not controlled by OPEC or Russia, about half of them are in Alberta. This fact is not lost on investors, including China. In early April this year, I traveled to China, met the Chinese um, National Energy Agency as well. Um, I met all the vice presidents of the major uh, national oil companies. Wen Ren was with, with me on that trip. And I think that helped confirm a number of questions that I had, but to summarize, I sensed a real interest on behalf of these companies to establish their reputations through their investments abroad in Canada and elsewhere and to develop and improve their brand image. In that regard, some of them talk about social responsibility, being good corporate citizens, developing strong community relations, and being generally viewed as locals um, in the areas where they operate. Talking, con contributing to climate change and environmental goals. So I think beyond just uh, strictly financial or, uh, investments, um, these companies are starting to look at uh, the broader uh, policy issues and, and realities of uh, operating in, in Canada and elsewhere, which is a good trend. Chinese purchases have recently become more ambitious, as we saw with the Sinopec Daylight Energy uh, recently, over $2 billion dollars. Um, as they're demonstrating a desire to become more than junior partners in Alberta's oil sands. This trend is likely to continue since mounting trade surpluses and growing foreign exchange reserves have made China the world's largest capital surplus economy. Another interesting and emerging trend I think we'll see soon is for Chinese petrochemical producers who will look for opportunities to integrate upstream and lock in stable, reliable feedstock supplies, especially natural gas now that's abundant and cheap here in North America, in order to produce higher value products here in North America and using uh, North America as a platform to compete globally. So here are some of the challenges that I see currently uh, facing us in developing our energy relationship with China. Certainly, China would like to have access to physical oil from Canada, but this is not necessarily a barrier to further investment. It, but if pipelines or rail options are realized, the potential for a much higher level of investment is very good. 
The term social license is a term we use in Canada a lot these days to describe the social contract or the level of public support we obtain uh, from citizens to continue to develop and market our resources. It's estimated that $30 million from an NGO called Tides USA has been directed through Tides Canada towards supporting uh, opposition to the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which would run from Alberta to the West Coast and bring uh, hydro, uh, crude oil uh, there to uh, presumably go on to Asia. There's a debate developing now in British Columbia in particular about the benefits and risks of oil pipelines and who reaps the benefits and how much and who bears the risk and costs associated with potential accidents. Canadians are also sensitive to keeping as many jobs and economic benefits as possible at home and so there's a healthy discussion ongoing about how to add value to our resources in Canada and that includes in the petrochemical and agrochemical sector where there may be good opportunities. The Asia Pacific Foundation uh, in Canada, uh, their 2011 national opinion poll on Canadian public perspectives regarding Asia suggests the Canadian public uh, is wary of a significant role for Chinese national oil companies in Canada's energy industry. In 2011, 55% of Canadians saw Asian investment as good for Canada, compared with 59% in 2008. In the past year, the number of Canadians in favour of a Chinese SOE acquiring a controlling stake in a major Canadian company declined from 18% to 16%. So it's, it's certainly um, a challenge around the perception of Chinese companies in Canada that uh, needs to be addressed. Finally, discussions have begun amongst provinces, who are, by the way, the owners of natural resources in Canada. Uh, it's important. It's a constitutional authority that uh, is given to provinces over natural resources within their boundaries. Um, discussions have begun amongst provinces about developing a Canadian energy strategy that would be collaborative and give coherence to our joint efforts in becoming a global energy leader. The Premier of Alberta, Alison Redford, has been leading this discussion with her provincial counterparts, and I would expect we will see this initiative evolve steadily through this year and beyond. A key component of that strategy would be a market diversification strategy with Asia at the center of it. We're also developing an Asia strategy as our engagement in Asia should not be just about China. We need to hedge and balance with a range of players. China is important, but it's not the only potential partner we have. That's why we're currently fully engaged in energy talks with Japan and soon with Korea and others as we go forward. Um, this slide uh, just explains a few of the uh, challenges that we see on the, on the China side to uh, enhance relationships. Certainly reciprocity is an issue for us. There are barriers uh, perceived and real in further investing in, in China, and we have energy companies that are very interested in participating in China, and we're concerned about uh, that there be non-discrimination for Canadian companies uh, in that market. There are tariff and non-tariff barriers to certainly to value-added products uh, to China, so um, they obviously favor the import of uh, raw material and certainly issues around transparency and regu regulation. Finally, for Canada and for Alberta, any strategic engagement with China must begin with a clear sense of what our long-term interests are, our goals and vision for where we want this relationship to go. We also need to be clear on if there are boundaries on this relationship or red lines that must not be crossed. At one time, such a red line issue may have been the complete takeover of a Canadian energy company by a Chinese state-owned enterprise. However, that line was crossed last year with Sinopec's acquisition of Daylight Energy for $2.2 billion. Earlier this year in March, when our Prime Minister visited China, the Canada-China Energy Cooperation Agreement was renewed. This is an umbrella agreement under which a number of implementing agreements and initiatives may be undertaken. Alberta, as Canada's largest energy producer, is currently having talks with the National Energy Administration of China to formalize an MOU that would create a mechanism for dialogue on energy policy issues on an ongoing basis. 
sometime this year, we expect to sign this MOU with China and another one uh, with Japan. In fact, I'm flying back tomorrow to uh, Calgary to, uh, to meet with Japan on, on this particular agreement. Some of the other issues and questions we need to address uh, and are considering are, are noted in the slide above. So um, I, uh, I hope I've been able to provide you with at least a brief overview of China and Canada's uh, developing energy relationship. I think it's important we engage with China uh, as their role in the world continues to evolve to help ensure our place in shaping the future of that role and helping secure our own prosperity and security into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think we're, there's bits that are, some of what you're saying rings true in the U.S. as well, but we're going to see what uh, Adam's PowerPoint's getting up there. But thank you so much. I was gathering questions in my head there for you, but good. Oh, the clicker. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Lysenko, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Rhodium Group, I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars for the invitation to come here today and to, um, to present on a very timely and interesting topic, which is Chinese investment in North American energy. Um, the interesting story of Chinese investment in North American energy is taking place in the context of a bigger, in my opinion, maybe even more interesting story, which is the diaspora, the renaissance, if you will, of Chinese outward foreign direct investment, which has, over the last 10 years, increased dramatically. Um, the slide up here is a screenshot of Rhodium Group's China Investment Monitor, which is an innovative tool that we maintain on our website that is built on a database of individual Chinese investment deals in the United States that we've researched and we've determined um, important characteristics like deal value, uh, sector of investment, investment activity, whether or not the investment is related to uh, a company that is controlled by the Chinese government. And by using this ground-up approach to build um, a database of Chinese investments in the United States, uh, we've been provided with a very unique ability to analyze Chinese investment patterns in the United States and make interesting conclusions. Um, our key findings from all of this research uh, include quite simply that Chinese direct investment in the United States is soaring. Uh, Chinese firms have opened operations in at least 35 of the 50 United States and have invested at least $15 billion in the United States since 2003, and that's likely an underestimate. Um, we also project that if China follows patterns of other emerging nations, uh, it would not be unreasonable to assume that China could be responsible for up to a trillion dollars of outward foreign direct investment flow by 2020. So obviously there's a huge potential to capture investment from China uh, in North America. Now as far as how these investments are broken down, um, there are a few trends that I want to point out. This, this chart illustrates investment patterns by industry in the United States from 2003 to 2011. Uh, the first obvious trend is growth. Since 2003, Chinese investment in the United States has consistently increased. Um, this little bump in 2005 is mostly accounted for Levono, or Levono's acquisition of IBM's computer industry in 2005. And despite a slight dip in overall investment values in 2011, Chinese investment activity in the United States in 2012 so far has been active enough that we're fairly confident that it will surpass the 2011 total. We expect Chinese investment in the United States to continue to increase. Another interesting trend is that until 2009, Chinese investment in the U.S. energy sector was fairly minimal. Uh, this wasn't, of course, due to a lack of interest on the part of the Chinese. Everyone here, I'm sure, is familiar with CNUC's failed attempt to acquire Unical in 2005. That $18.5 billion acquisition, had it gone through, would have been uh, equal to the cumulative sum of investment deals that I have listed here on this chart. That was a big deal. Um, but since that didn't work, uh, major investment in U.S. energy sectors really started to take off in 2010 and 2011. And most of that investment was focused in, um, in oil and gas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, additional trend is that uh, investment in renewable and clean energy in the United States remains relatively small. And while there are motivations for Chinese firms to locate uh, in the United States and to invest in renewable energies, these motivations are a lot different than the motivations that are bringing uh, Chinese oil firms to invest in large numbers in the United States. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, but it does make sense that Chinese firms uh, are investing heavily in American oil and gas. It fits Chinese trends. Chinese companies are very hungry for oil. 
uh, as energy grows in China. Energy needs continue to grow in China. Uh, China is looking outwards uh, more and more for uh, other sources to feed their energy needs. Um, in 2011, Chinese oil firms announced about $18.3 billion worth of bids for overseas oil and gas exploration and production companies. Now, it also makes sense that Chinese oil firms are locating in uh, North America. 50% of all global oil and gas deal flows in 2011 took place in North America, and they were worth cumulatively about $100 billion. Now, about half of those, in terms of deal value, were uh, cross-border deals. And like we'll elaborate more as we continue to discuss, this is largely due to the boom in North American unconventional oil and gases. So talking a little bit more about Chinese investment in oil and gas, since that is where most of the investment in U.S. energy has been to date, um, there are a few trends that we should note. Um, Chinese firms have changed their investment strategy in the United States. I think it's safe to say that uh, they learned a lot from the failed Unicall bid. And since that Unicall bid, other uh, investments in U.S. oil and gas have uh, been a lot more, uh, maybe less threatening, less intimidating, you could say. Uh, that 2005 scenic bid for Unicall was worth $18.5 billion and would have resulted in complete ownership of the American firm. Since then, notable big-ticket investments in U.S. energy have included Scenic's uh, acquisitions of interest in Chesapeake Energy and Sinopec's acquisition in, in an interest in Devon Energy. Now, all of these acquisitions have had minority stakes. They've had relatively small investment amounts, you know, not topping $2.5 billion, which, while still large in absolute terms, pales in comparison to Unicall's $18.5 billion value. Um, and the Chinese firms in these investment arrangements have not had any controlling power in the development of these assets. So the American firms, Devon Energy and Chesapeake Energy, have maintained the ability to determine how to develop the assets that the Chinese firms have been invested in and how to take their product to market. So to date, Chinese, Chinese firms uh, still do not control any, uh, any oil production in the United States by themselves. Um, and that seems to have helped because uh, Sinook's successful acquisitions of Chesapeake Energy and Sinopec's successful investment in Devon Energy have received much less, uh, especially um, political um, difficulty than, than Sinook's acquisition of Unicall did. So that's one interesting trend. Uh, another interesting trend that other members of the panel will elaborate on more fully is the shift towards investment in shale gas in the United States, especially since 2005. Unicall was not a, um, an investment that would have created assets for Sinook in the unconventional oil and gas industries. But the last three, the two investments in Chesapeake Energy and Devon Energy, they all are. And this makes sense. Chinese firms are looking for experience. Um, the U.S. Energy Information Administration estimates that Chinese shale may hold 1.275 quadrillion cubic feet of gas. That's, that's a number bigger than trillion. It's really big. It's, <laughs> it's 12 times the country's conventional natural gas deposits and is almost 50 percent more of the technically recoverable reserves that exist in the United States. Um, and while we don't keep data on Canada at Rhodium Group, uh, according to one source, spending by Chinese state-owned enterprises in Canadian oil sands and shale gas companies and projects alone has reached about $20 billion since 2005. So these Chinese firms are clearly interested in gaining the experience in North American unconventional oil and gas that they can use to develop their own assets later. Now, moving forward, trends that we expect to continue, uh, we expect that unconventional oil and gas will dominate big-ticket investments by Chinese firms into North America. These big-ticket investments will continue to be dominated by state-owned enterprises. Um, the capital intensity of these investment projects and the available capital of state-owned enterprises make that a, a natural match. Uh, and we anticipate that these Chinese firms will continue to be interested in technology, in learning how to t harvest uh, unconventional oil and gas. Now, other potential areas of interest among Chinese firms, just as a side note, other than oil and gas, uh, conventional energy, that is, might include coal. Um, on May 7th, Guizhou Guochang Energy Holding Group said it had raised uh, about $616 million in a private placement to be used mainly to acquire and develop Triple H Coal Company, making it the first Chinese company to invest in coal in America. Now, as natural gas has continued to become cheap in the United States, uh, prices for coal have dropped. But since energy in China is still mainly reliant on coal, 
um, there's there's a, a, a huge demand and potential for Chinese investment in coal as well. We expect that we could see more of that in the future. Now, talking briefly about uh, alternative and renewable energies, because I know that's something that everyone here is very interested in. Uh, like I said before, investment in clean energy has been much smaller in North America, specifically in the United States, than in uh, conventional energy, specifically oil and gas. And one reason for this might be that compared to China and Europe, the United States renewable energy support regime is very fragmented and is not as friendly to foreign investment as other areas are. For instance, um, most of the um, most of the incentives that our government provides for clean energy firms to establish operations in the United States comes in the form of tax incentives. Now, if you're a foreign firm that doesn't already operate in the United States, that might not be very attractive to you because um, you might not be guaranteed enough revenue to have those tax incentives off offset whatever expenses you're going to be paying. Uh, that being said, clean energy firms do have reasons to locate in the United States, and I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, one of them is political risk. Uh, as everyone here is aware, the Commerce Department recently uh, um, informed us that they were going to be hiking import tariffs on solar panels from China considerably. And uh, one incentive for Chinese clean energy firms to locate in the United States might be to get around tariff barriers. Uh, one company that's done that is SunTech Power. They've established manufacturing and assembly facilities in Arizona, and that made in the USA um, made in the U.S., uh, ability to say that their product is made in the U.S.A. It will probably prove very valuable to them. Uh, another example is uh, moving up and down the value chain. Uh, Chinese firms are in the process right now of seeking greater profits by moving away from the middle of the value chain, just manufacturing sector, to try and move into upstream investment in research and development and downstream in services. Uh, Ingley Energy, Ingley Green Energy in California is another example of this. They've established a research and development um, investment in, in California that is moving up the value chain. Another reason that Chinese firms might wish to locate in the United States in, in green energy sectors is because of high logistical costs. And one example that comes to mind is Goldwind. I imagine that transportation costs are fairly expensive to move incredibly tall and heavy um, towers to support wind turbines onto the United States. And while Goldwind to date hasn't expressed any plans to establish any sort of manufacturing facility in the United States, it makes sense that as their market in America continues to grow, there would be an incentive for them to establish operations in the United States to cut costs. Um, another reason that firms might be interested in investing in uh, U.S. renewable energy is the fact that uh, Chinese firms are generally interested in investing in U.S. utilities. Utilities provide bond-like credit ratings for investors who are looking for vehicles with higher return than treasuries. And as investment comes into U.S. utilities, some of this investment will inevitably fall to clean energy. So looking forward, we anticipate that interest in financing renewable energy projects in the United States will likely depend on the design of the support regime in the United States. But uh, even in the absence of change, we would expect moderate investment in U.S. renewable and clean energy to continue. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and end there. Thank you very much. Pass the baton. Thank you. Okay, Bo Kong, you can tell us some stories. Oh, I'll try. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this timely and important event. And it, yeah, I'm also pleased and honored to uh, participate in such a high caliber panel. Um, I thought I would use my next 10, 15 minutes also to uh, talk about uh, two things primarily. One, uh, the patterns of Chinese investment in the U.S. energy sector, and two, how we ought to be thinking about the future of Chinese investment uh, in the U.S. energy sector. Uh, before I start, let me just say, uh, let me just um, say what my bottom line is. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, Chinese investment in the U.S. energy sector has grown, but it still pales in comparison pales in comparison with investment from other countries. So the magnitude should not be exaggerated. And secondly, I think it's likely, it's likely that the Chinese investment in, in, the, in the U.S. energy sector is like, it's, will grow. However, I think some, some, some of the issues have to be uh, resolved for this potential to come to fruition. I will highlight some of the challenges confronting Chinese investment in the U.S. energy sector. Let me first of all uh, focus on the patterns of Chinese investment in, in the U.S. 
Um, to understand the patterns, I think we have to look at a couple issues. First, who is really investing in the U.S. energy sector? And how is this investment down in the U.S. energy sector? And then what is the investment after, right? Uh, if you look at who is investing uh, in the U.S. energy sector, I think the story is quite similar to what's happening in Alberta. Um, the Chinese national oil companies are investing. Um, the Chinese state-owned energy companies are investing. Also, the, China sovereign, uh, the, China, the, the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund is also investing. And then there's also private investment capital that's, that's going after some of the energy projects in the U.S. And how is the investment done in the U.S.? I think this, this has to be discussed in the context of what happened in 2005 to uh, Sinocaus, um, to Unicaus, uh, uh, to Sinocaus fiasco in acquiring the California-based Unicaus. Uh, since that, that particular, uh, that, that, dis that failure, the Chinese energy CEOs were quite jittered by the experience they encountered in the U.S. And so what, what happened afterward, after the, the Unicaus deal, uh, was the Chinese NOCs, uh, Chinese energy executives pretty much shied away from the U.S. And then back to what Adam just said, you know, starting uh, a, a, you know, year, a year or so ago, the Chinese NOCs and Chinese energy companies start to look at the, 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 the U.S. market again. This takes place against the backdrop of a number of things. First, uh, in the, because of the, globe, the recent global financial crisis, the U.S. is faced with car, a very carbon, a very capital constrained world. Um, shale gas, for example, is very, very capital-intensive business. For, if you talk to the, the industry people, they will tell you that a, to drill one well, one, one, you know, one shale gas well, you need more capital than a conventional oil well or gas well. You know, for example, I think the, the number is roughly $9 million per well, something like that. So it's very, very capital-intensive. So, you know, in the post-financial uh, crisis uh, world, capital is very, very hard to come by in the United States. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, some of the renewable energy companies in the U.S. are faced with capital constraint as well. As a result, many of the renewable companies actually have closed their shops in, chi in the U.S. and decided to open up shops in China. But I will... I will, I, will, I will reserve that uh, for, for, future, for, for later uh, remarks um, with regard to a renewable energy company. And, and the Chinese NOCs have really learned from their uh, 2005 experience uh, in, in approaching their investment in U.S. shale gas. And, of course, the, the other big story is China is now known to have tremendous shale gas reserves at least 10 times of the conventional gas reserves um, it has. And the government of China uh, is keenly aware of the challenge it has to deal with with regard to climate uh, negotiations and pressure to reduce CO2 emissions. As the international clim climate negotiations is at a crossroad, it's, uh, the government of China is keenly sensitive to the fact that as the largest CO2 emitter, it may not be able to continue to tell the international community that China will continue to reduce its carbon intensity. So it's fully aware of this growing pressure for China to, to reduce absolute CO2 emissions. But however, if you look at China's energy trajectory, consumption patterns, the country's energy consumption won't peak before 2020 or 2025. So it's going to take a little while for the energy consumption to peak. And energy consumption is, is correlated with the country's CO2 emissions simply because of the energy consumption patterns or the energy consumption mix that's dominated by coal or fossil fuel. So the, one, 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 possible, uh, one possible solution is to promote clean energy and to promote natural gas consumption. That's why natural gas has become uh, very, very important. However, sitting on that, that you know, huge reserves does not mean China, Chinese companies have the capability and all, all the experience to develop that resources. And therefore, when Chinese NOCs invest in the U.S. shale gas, they, what they have in mind is 
through this experience, they can gain access to technology, they can gain access to experience, they can gain access to management experience. However, what happened so far is quite different. And this actually is important to, to, to understand because it tells you a lot about the motivations uh, that drives Chinese companies to invest in the U.S. shale gas. If you look at how these deals have been structured, and this far, the Chinese NOCs don't have access to technologies. The U.S. companies, U.S. shale gas companies, U.S. energy companies actually have built a firewall uh, preventing Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, nationals from accessing technologies. For example, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Eagle Ford deal uh, just mentioned a moment ago, Sinuk cannot second its workers to, uh, to Sinuk. That means Sinuk cannot assign its oil workers to work together with, with Chesapeake oil workers. In other words, the Chinese oil workers will keep at arm's length from U.S. energy technologies. That's one important feature. The other important feature, of course, is this non-threatening, non-inclusive non, non, non sort of uh, uh, fashion in which the Chinese NOCs invest in U.S. shale gas. And in contrary to the past, the Chinese NOCs now don't acquire ownership of American energy companies. As such, Chinese energy companies don't have the ability to dictate, as Adam pointed out, um, you know, where the production will happen and where the, 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 you know, the output will go. You know, this is quite different from you know, the, the investment made by Chinese NOCs elsewhere. Uh, for example, in Africa, Latin America, or Central Asia where they oftentimes have the ability to move around their production. And they can determine whether they want to sell that production to the international oil market or they can sell that production to domestic market, although the vast, uh, the vast majority of production actually is sold to the international, the international market because of economic concerns, because of economic considerations. In the U.S., however, the Chinese NOCs, as far as the shale gas investment is concerned, don't have the ability to determine when, where the production will go, and, and they don't have, uh, they have not acquired ownership of these companies. This, this raises an interesting question. What is this investment really after? Is it really after, you know, uh, oil security, energy security? Not quite. If the capital, if the investment is after energy security, then you will see evidence that points to the shipment of these oil production, either back to China or, you know, or the ability of these Chinese companies to access, you know, sensitive technologies that allow these Chinese companies to tap into their resources at home. So this far, none of this is happening. That means, you know, I think the Chinese NOCs are paying more attention to the experience, to the exposure they hope to gain by working with American companies. For example, the Chinese NOCs want to learn where do you, where do American companies, you know, <clears throat> decide where, where, how do they decide to drill, where to drill, how to allocate these resources, how to allocate these assets. This is a very important. Another hypothesis is that this Chinese, uh, this Chinese capital is really after capital returns, and particularly, this is true for a Chinese sovereign wealth fund. Uh, for example, CIC, China, China, China Investment Corporation, that has invested in a couple of U.S. companies in the U.S. And that investment, in my view, is purely driven by the desire to seek higher, higher capital returns. Because if you look at the picture in China, opportunities actually are very constrained. China now has turned, has transformed itself from a capital scarce country to a capital abundant country. So capital is start, you know, all banks are washed with cash. However, opportunities that can yield high returns are not that many. And state-owned state banks actually gave, you know, terrible low returns to depositors. And in the way, that's the model that really drives the Chinese economic growth. Chinese economic growth really hinges on cheap capital. So now the capital you know, because of lack of opportunities at home, actually all goes abroad 
to seek higher opportunities, to seek you know more fruitful opportunities. And so that's that's sort of you know one hypothesis that you can you can come up you can come up with depend you know based on the the investment patterns of of Chinese companies in in the U.S., particularly with regard to the shale gas sector, and then look into looking into the future. What can we expect? How do we think about Chinese investment in the U.S. energy sector? I think we have to be clear that you know the Chinese investment in certain energy sector probably is likely to grow, but it's not likely to grow in other sectors. Why? Why is that? Well, do you think we will see more investment from China into U.S. For example, nuclear sector? Probably not. Why? Because if you look at the electricity growth rate of this country, over the next two decades, electricity will only grow at 1% also, less than 1%. And then you look at shale gas and then you know, lack of loan guarantee. It's clearly, that, it's clearly true that the, US, the Chinese companies won't be investing in U.S. You know, nuclear sector, right? Not to mention that it's very sensitive. I don't think the American public is ready for Chinese investment into the sector. <clears throat> and then what about utilities? I think this is a very interesting case. You look at utilities in China, they are in terrible, terrible shape. And utilities have, you know, the debt, the debt to asset ratio in China for all those five, you know, centrally state owned uh, power generation companies is above 85%. It's above 85%. A lot of them actually are on the verge of bankruptcy were, you know, if they were not supported by the state. And some of the local power generation companies are actually already you know, faced with this possibility of bankruptcy. So I don't think the Chinese utility companies have the ability or have the will whistle to invest in U.S. utility companies. So I think for anyone that that hopes to see Chinese investment into U.S. utilities or, or you know, related infrastructure, I think you know, we have to be a little bit, you know, sort of, uh, we have to really lower ex our expectations. Nevertheless, I do agree with Adam that we are likely to see more investment from China into the U.S. coal sector. Why is that? Because in China, coal prices you know, have really you know, gone up almost seven times, six, seven times in the past couple of years. We used to think that coal is really cheap in China. China has abundantly, you know, uh, uh, China has abundant and cheap coal. That's no longer true, ladies and gentlemen. China now is the largest coal importer of the world. China replaced Japan to be the largest coal importer last year. And this import dependency is, is, continuing, grow, is continuing to grow over the next couple of years before the, the transport bottleneck is finally resolved. I think it's going to take not, at least another five to eight years for this transport bottleneck to be resolved, for the government's plan to, to you know, form large consortiums uh, to, to succeed. That means, in the meantime, it's actually cheaper for southern China and coastal China to buy coal from overseas than buy coal from northern China and western China. That also means when in a post-Fukushima world, when Japan has to import more fossil fuel to generate its electricity. You know, by the way, Japan entered into nuclear zero period now, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, ev all the electricity is fossil fuel pretty much. Although Japan is trying to accelerate renewable, you know, power generation, it's going to take a while for Japan to get there. So in the meantime, China will be competing with all these, you know, Asian economies that, that really need energy to generate power. So China, you know, Chinese companies have turned to the U.S. for, for coal imports. I, I think this trend is going, going to um, continue to grow. What about renewable power? I think I'm less upbeat about Chinese investment into uh, U.S. renewable power, simply because if you look, if you think about the, the, the whole value chain and ask what Chinese companies' competitive advantage is, their competitive advantage is really, it doesn't really, you know, doesn't really uh, focus on design and R&D. Their competitive advantage is really focused on assembling, production, and manufacturing. And it's that, it's, it's that fundamental fact that determines that we are unlikely to see a lot of renewable investment in the U.S. because of labor cost, because of manufacturing cost, a little bit higher in the U.S., and maybe of, not even policies to not, encourage it. Exactly. Growth, yeah. However, I think it's, you know, you will see some private capital 
that it's likely to th you know, explore opportunities in, in the renewable sector in the US, as evidenced by Inley, Suntech, and others who are, for example, experiencing a lot of difficulties right now in China. We always think of, when we think of China, we always, we tend to think that China is really, you know, the juggernaut that, that's expanding renewable like crazy. But in fact, the picture is less, is a little bit more sophisticated. Right now, renewable companies, particularly solar companies, are going, going through a lot of difficulties in China. Because Chinese solar companies export 95% of the capacity. But, but as Europe and the US start to change policies, their export market is having problems right now. But domestic, domestically, China doesn't have the ability to absorb the capacity. And therefore, because of the capacity glut, a lot of companies have to really close down, you know, reduce their capacity, or, or otherwise they will be faced with this, this possibility of a survival test. So I think, I think this means that you know, going forward, you know, Chinese investment in this area is likely to be limited. And I think for this potential to, to you know, come to fruition, two things have to happen. On the, on the Chinese side, Chinese companies have to change the way they operate and become more transparent. You know, Aust what Chinese companies have done in Australia is really a very interesting example. You know, the Australian government, for example, requires Chinese coal companies to change their structure, to list their assets on the Australian stock market to appoint to uh, you know hire and appoint Australian executives to make sure these companies don't answer to the call of Beijing and that's essentially the the key concern you know because of lot, because of these a lot of the investment is done by state owned energy companies the concern is these state owned energy companies will answer to the call of Beijing rather than the call of market so you know i think the chinese energy state owned energy companies have to demonstrate that they actually pay more attention, they actually follow the commercial logic rather than the strategic imperative of Beijing. And in fact, I believe many of them have already moved in that direction, simply you know, in the era of reform and globalization. But this is a two-way street, so it takes two to tangle. That means the US also has to do something to entice Chinese investment. You know, in fact, if you, if you take a look at the investment framework in the U.S., investing in the U.S. actually is, should be principally easier than investing in China because of you know, the, the, the regulatory framework, et cetera, in, in place, right? But the Chinese actually don't understand the regulatory framework. Just, let me just share one story with you and end my, my, my remarks. This, I don't want to name the company because you know, I know the company pretty well. And, uh, and this private renewable company, Right, very, very, you know, established, very, you know, growing company in China, and this, the, the chairman of the the the, uh, the company and the chairman of the board of directors didn't really have, you know, a high education. He didn't go to college. He went to high school. Then he he's, he sort of is a self-made person. You know, he moved into gas, and then later on he expanded into renewable. And he formed this partnership with Duke Energy. And, and then when Hu Jintao came to the U.S., you know. In, in 2011, he basically said at the strategic, uh, you know, uh, dial, strategic renewable energy forum, he basically declared that his company wanted to invest $10 million in the U.S. And then he sent two people who didn't speak English to come to the U.S. to take a tour to study energy projects. And they didn't talk to any lawyers. And they basically went around and did, they didn't even speak English, you know. And then they went around and they basically talked to this, you know, later on they bumped into this, the lawyer who, who had this conversation with me. He, they told this lawyer, we wanted to invest $10 million in the U.S. The lawyer asked him, how? Wh what, are you, what are you proposing? What, do you, what, what are you thinking exactly? I don't think the Chinese companies, particularly the private investment, you know, private capital, you know, particular private entrepreneurs have thought through these questions because they're so used to doing business in China where you simply build relationship with the government that everything is taken care of. That's not how this country works, right? You have to, you have to understand the rules, the regulatory frameworks, everything. You have to talk to lawyers, have to really get, get the smart people like Adam, you know, other investment bankers <laughs> to, to help you finance and structure your deal. I think on that note, I think that gives me the reason to think that it, it's probably going to take a little while for this relationship really to, to, to flourish. 
but but uh, you know I think we we all have a role to play here in in facilitating the information in getting the stories out in in, in helping Jennifer uh, oh. to do more <laughs> forums like this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Phew. Okay. I'm not the one investing, but yeah. Thank you. In the back of your minds, remember Cole. Okay. We'll get back to Cole in the Q and A. It always comes back to Cole. When run. All right, Jennifer. The clock is. The clock is ticking. Ticking. So I'm going minutes. to be uh, brief. Thank you very much, Jennifer David, for having me back. And uh, I've been a Wilson Center fellow. Once a Wilson Center fellow, always want to be called as fellow. So uh, glad to be back here. I think uh, we have interesting discussion already so far. Jeff talked about this kind of the China angle mostly. Adam, U.S., China, and with uh, board really uh, putting a lot of the Chinese investment uh, dimensions uh, out. Uh, what I will do in the next few minutes, hopefully we can open up the um, discussion very soon, is have, let's have a look at this, what I call the a emerging Canada-US-China energy triangle. Uh, this is a uh, fairly new uh, topic, I think, in the past few years. All of a sudden, it's in front of us. and. Uh, it is uh, in each of the countries involved, it has become a public policy issue. Uh, definitely it's a foreign policy issue. And of course, uh, it is uh, having a, 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 a you know, sector wise, you have uh, energy involved, foreign policy involved, domestic debate involved. And so it's certainly emerging as a research, academic research agenda as well. And you can see many young people here, interns, uh, academics, intelligence. Community. So I think it's interesting to uh, explore that. Uh, this triangle from the Chinese side is actually very simple. They don't debate very much domestically. Uh, I don't think it's a public policy inside China. It's a foreign policy issue. For the Chinese, they would love to invest in North America. And they perceive uh, their investments now since at least mid-2009, uh, after a three-year cooling period of the conservative government from Canada, warming up. And uh, Canada is more receptive to the Chinese investment uh, uh, than the United States. So they come to Canada big time, as Jeff already uh, mentioned to you. They put in about $16 billion in eight major energy deals in the past two and a half years alone. If you add the debt assumed, it would be around $20 billion. That's unprecedented. And uh, this is, uh, Adam mentioned uh, Chesapeake, uh, Sinook after the Unico deal coming in with a few billion dollars already. So we see the beginning of the trend. And uh, the issue for the Chinese worrisome is U.S., Canada are NATO allies. Uh, they're far away. If they put in a large amount of money in here, what happens if in the future there will be a, some kind of a tension potentially between China and the United States in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, or around the world, as the two super emerge, the one is an emerging superpower, the other is an existing one. Uh, they would assume that Canada might line up with the United States. So there are worries remaining. On the Canadian side, uh, we look at this and we say, well, none of our oil is exported to China so far. It's primarily to the United States. As Jeff mentioned, we've got one customer. It's no good sometimes if you have one customer. It's better to have a few more good customers. But the, more few, the few more good customers are too far away across the Pacific. And even in Canada, we have to pay, build the pipelines from Alberta to BC, uh, to the West Coast. So we've got to see this dynamic that we feel the Keystone XL pipeline has been first postponed and then uh, denied and now probably be re resumed after the next U.S. presidential election, our approach is more of a market-based. We want diversification. China and the United States, they're primarily seeking as importers of oil. They're seeking for security of supply. For Canada, our logic is a little bit different. We're seeking the security of demand. We want people to buy our oil. If the United States having domestic increased supply, shale revolution, and keystone problems, we want to look into Asia. Asia is big. China, Japan, South Korea, India, Taiwan combined, they consume daily barrels of oil similar to the United States, nearly 20 million barrels. And two-thirds two of them are imported rather than half of the U.S. import. 
So you're looking at the market potential of China and India combined account for anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of the new growth in the global oil market in the coming years and decades. So we know that's where the future is, and we'd like to have those. But we, do, we don't have access, uh, not much. We have a mountain line by the Kinder Morgan that's shipping about 300,000 barrels per day. Northern Gateway by Enbridge, designed to have over half a million barrels per day, is not there in place. Debate is, uh, is hiding up. And we also argue why we'd want to dig out our oil sands with all the impact on environment and then shape it to Asia or China. So these debates are waging in Canada. And uh, uh, while the government has put on a clear logic, or the industry, the logic of what I call the logic of the market, I don't think the public is very convinced on other dimensions of why we should export more oil uh, in the future to, uh, to Asia or to China. Americans on this triangle, I think, uh, watching, as we can see now with this forum, uh, and uh, maybe a little bit alert, uh, but I think it's, it's wait and see situation. So let me um, then, that's where things are. Let me raise uh, three questions for discussion uh, rather than keep going with my own observations. One is then, uh, what is the nature uh, of this emerging Canada, US, China energy triangle? How do we, how do we approach this? Uh, is this a, the Chinese investment in Canada or in the United States? Uh, as I see it, it has a very early stage of development. And China is going to come big. Is this what kind of situation we're looking at? How do we view this? in comparison or in connection with China's other foreign policy behaviors around the world, especially vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Is this a predatory behavior of China, as some people described? China is having this global expansion of a military, industrial, and foreign policy agenda to take over Uncle Sam's assets or sphere of influence piece by piece? Uh, is this the empire expanding, trying to weaken the United States? I've been in this town enough. I go to Capitol Hill and people there, senators, congressmen telling me, frankly, why would we want to make China stronger by giving them easy access to energy and other investments? This is our potential rival. So you can look at this relationship from this angle and then stop the evil empire from expanding. That's one way of looking at this. And there are people, plenty of them, want to do this. Because they say the Chinese are playing by different rules. All the NOCs are arms of the state. And uh, they feel worried about it. Understandable, although not in reality it's true. Or we can look at this relationship. In nature, it is a emerging economy with a large population trying to urbanize, trying to make a better living, and trying to feed its need uh, for continuous growth. And China's population is only half of them, or half urbanized. There are another half who will be using more energy, <clears throat> will be urbanized, will be having all the sort of appetite to pursue a middle class, American dream of having cars, having refrigerators, having ref, you know, fridges, something that will consume a lot of energy. Okay, so we can think about that dimension. China is not only having its own domestic feed, China produces for the rest of the world. 40% of China's GDP is tied to foreign trade, and 70% of China's foreign trade is produced by foreign multinationals, especially Americans, who move their production sites, especially energy and emission incentive production lines to China for the export purposes. So China is producing, satisfying our need, anywhere between 35% to 75% of home appliances are produced in China for the rest of the world's consumption under all brand names. So we can look at this triangle through a lens of development needs. So I leave it as there, that's the first question. 
And second question, what is a likely uh, uh, scenario in the coming years and decades uh, in the Chinese investment uh, in Canada and the United States and how it shape our future? Uh, I mentioned that China has a urbanization drive. In the next 10 to 15 years, there will be another 300 some 50 million people. The entire US population would be urbanized. We're witnessing in the past two or three decades the largest internal migration in world history, 130 million people moving to urban centers to work, migrant workers. And they will use, it's still nearly 100 million people in China, by the way, living on about a dollar per day. These people need to consume more energy, okay? So there will be domestic demand, there will be domestic income, and they will pursue more use of energy. And secondly, with the scale of the economy coming to maturity, and the Chinese will have surplus capital, which is the logic of capitalism. Surplus capital, $3.2 trillion foreign reserve, and Bob mentioned very important dimension of large scale private capital will all want to flow abroad. So the investment in North America and, and around the world is just beginning. And so far, they have identified, especially since last year, North America, especially Canada, tops the list, even ahead of Australia, as the destination of FDI. But if you look at the total numbers of Chinese foreign investment in tangible assets, not portfolios, it's only about $250 billion so far, accumulatively. But China has about seven to $8 trillion domestic saving now, as we know, by 2018 to 2020, China would have about $17, $18 trillion of domestic savings. Very similar to the projected U.S. deficit, by the way, by then. <laughs> and if China only take 5% of that to invest abroad, China would invest abroad $800 billion per year. I actually had doubt on this number I've been looking at. But President, Vice President Xi Jinping, who visited here back in February, gave a big talk in the business group saying, by 2015, China would have $500 billion to invest abroad. So if you have seen so far anything, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> so Chinese are coming. So how do we cope with that? Uh, what is the development need for the China's energy need, are we going to receive, receive more Chinese investment? One part of my talk with Chinese NOC senior executives, policymakers, after our Prime Minister Stephen Harper visits China back in February, was that great, very, very good environment between the bilateral uh, political context. Let's put another 50 to $100 billion into Canada. Chinese have no problem conceiving that. And I go back to Jeff. And to our other policymakers in the province, in the federal government, I said, are we ready? The question is, we're not ready. We're debating, how do we cope with this? We need to come with some decisions on the nature of this foreign investment of China and how to deal with China. So that's the second uh, uh, question that I, I, I raise. Um, the third question uh, then is some policy dimensions. How, how should we approach this relationship? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I personally prefer it's not a zero-sum game. We could make it a plus-sum game because the nature of the internationalization division of labor, that I would like to say that if we solve China's energy shortage issues, and we're solving our own problems because much of our products line, Walmart or otherwise, are being produced in China. And we can make it a three-way winning situation. On the policy side, less confrontation or more cooperation probably will help everybody. On the private side, as some people say, the Chinese money are coming out anyway. The question now is, are you the individual or the company or the country who will make the money out of the Chinese foreign investment? You can be consulting, you can be doing policy coordination, you can do all the sort of things, uh, but there's many, many things. Research agenda, you can think. I think, finally, one point. Okay. I know time is coming. We need a more integrated approach in dealing with energy and environment issues, which is Jennifer's favorite topic. We so far separate both, which is wrong. 
I think we need to find a better approach than the mar logic of market to look at how do we work with China on energy and environment front. Uh, and I have a report coming up on this particular one. So rather than selling all my points out, I would just leave it as a point of discussion. And say, invite me back later <laughs> is the subliminal message <laughs> there. Sorry, hey, applause for uh, this guy here. <laughs> Everyone talked about dancing in triangles, so I have to say we're talking a love triangle here, aren't we? Yes, an energy love triangle. All right, let's um, raise your hand if you have a question. And then I have uh, interns, smart interns. Uh, why don't you come on up here, Lizzie? We'll start, at, we'll start on this side of the room. And uh, just say your name and, and succinct questions so we can get through lots of them. And I did get one from upstairs, and I haven't read it yet. Um, <coughs> should I read this one now while yeah. we get it? From Wayne Lee from American University, who's, who is banished up to the sixth floor overflow room. Given that China's investment will not put big threats to U.S. and Canada's energy security, and that China might learn to be more cooperative and responsible through the investment, what, what you know, basically, like, what's to worry about? You know, what, what shall we worry about? Does that make sense? Um, I'm not sure that we need to worry. Um, I think there are issues that we need to consider. Um, related to that investment. I tried to point out some of them in my presentation. Um, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that the Chinese state-owned enterprises um, don't have a lot of experience operating in, in um, open economies uh, where there are transparency requirements. Uh, I know all the three state-owned enterprises are now listed, I think, on the New York Stock Exchange, which which forces some, some level of transparency there. but. Um, they're learning um, how to operate. Uh, certainly in Canada, they, they've expressed a willingness to become locals, uh, to invest in communities, to be good corporate citizens, and they're very open to any advice and uh, uh, suggestions that we may have. So um, I, I think if we carefully manage our relationship, I think if we're clear on our expectations and our goals for this relationship, that we work uh, closely with them, that we continue our dialogue. I don't, I don't think there are necessarily worries. Uh, I think we can manage through it. Um, so that's, I guess, how I would uh, respond to that. Okay. Yeah. What, do you want to ask your question? Uh, hi. My name is Christopher Peterson. I'm with American University as well. Um, <laughs> Tribal behavior here. Yes. Um, this question is kind of in relation to how Mr. Bo finished up his um, remarks. Uh, you mentioned that um, the development of you know Chinese uh, direct foreign investment in energy is likely going to um, be pivotal on whether or not they can um, divorce the uh, decision-making for the companies from the political decision-making process. And I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate a little bit on that point, uh, give us examples of how uh, Cinepec or some of the other uh, state-owned energy companies are um, you know, making more business decisions and uh, how critical this will be for kind of balancing other countries' you know, national security concerns with their desire for uh, being included in the energy markets. Yes. Well, thank you for your question. Um, I think you can look at the patterns of behavior of these companies in, in the past um, to look for evidence. Um, that's one way to look at this. And the other way is to look at whether um, inherently they share the same embedded priorities uh, of Beijing, or their priorities diverge from those of Beijing, or whether they converge on some occasions but diverge on other occasions. And then you will develop a nuanced approach to, to, uh, to deal with these companies. And just to give you one example of how these companies um, oftentimes uh, um, share different um, priorities than Beijing. Uh, when it comes to oil prices, for example, Beijing has this um, um, bifurcated interest. On the one hand, Beijing hopes to uh, see oil prices stable and see oil prices low so that they don't uh, become a, 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 
they don't complicate the country's effort to uh, keep inflation low. Um, don't you know complicate the country's effort to keep the country's production uh, you know competitive. And however, the oil companies uh, who have to you know uh, care about their own survivals in in the era of reform. Uh, I'm uh, actually torn by the fact that Beijing is reluctant to give control over oil product prices, meaning that the more products they sell, the more losses they incur. So clearly you have diverging incentives and diverging priorities. That's why when these Chinese NOCs uh, engage in cross-border investment, they actually are engaged in arbitrage of institutions in the sense that Domestically, they can't sell oil, their oil product prices at market levels. And therefore, you can argue um, they have inherent incentive actually to sell oil products at market prices elsewhere. And indeed, this, is, has, this has been confirmed by the customs data in China. Um, in, in, in multiple cases, when China, in southern China, you know, uh, experienced artificial uh, oil product shortages. It's not due to a lack of supply. However, it's due to the incentive of these refineries to smuggle their oil products ov over to other parts of, of, of the world, particularly Southeast Asian countries. So I think I point that to a clear example of diverging incentives. And then I also point a point to the the ambition of these companies to become globally competitive companies to become companies with global brand and global uh, global reputation nevertheless i don't discount for example that the relationship between these companies and the chinese government after all they are government owned entities therefore i think for the us government um you know, to consider these these struct to consider these deals or these investment arrangements. Back to you know Professor Jiang's question: uh, How how do governments uh, look at these 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 investment deals, these opportunities? I think you know the capacity to regulate these companies becomes a central variable here. You know, in contrast to with many other resource-rich developing countries that don't prove to have enough regulatory capacity, I'm not terribly worried about resource-rich developed countries such as Canada, Australia, Norway, or U.S., right? These countries have established, you know, rigorous regulatory frameworks in place that can monitor, track, and regulate foreign investment from any country, from China, from you know, democratic or non-democratic countries. So I think that's the key variable here. Should note too, we're going to have Alva Media on this soon because I've been trying to explore like uh, Sino Hydro, that you know we know that a lot of Chinese dam builders are building dams in southeast, um, southwest China, but also in Southeast Asia. And so the thought has been, well, of course they're building it to supply China. And I'm starting to get news that well, actually, there's some of the dams in China are considering actually they can get a better price if they sell it across the border, kind of viewing Southeast Asia as this larger hydro market. And even, so I mean, that's, it's, I'm still trying to understand this, but I'm catching, you know, it's like the company, it's an example of the company wants to go where they could get the better price, and, not and necessarily, you know, supplying mothership China, right? If I may, Jennifer, and also this is a good place to add the question, to raise the question, who gives them right? Who gives the right to the Chinese companies to sell the electricity back to China? It's the government, it's the host the government, right? So you have to look at the incentive of host government as well. I have argued that some of the host governments of resource-rich countries also have bifurcated interest with regard to how to, how to use their energy resources for private interests or for collective interests. You look at Africa, you know, many resource-rich countries are known for being cursed by resources, right? right. Why? Because they have bifurcated interests as well. So I think that's an important dimension. Okay. All right. You, got, you, you hold the mic, so you have the power now. Just get us. Thank you. Uh, it's Jim Epstathew. I'm with Bloomberg News. Um, I'm kind of left anticipating something. I'm not sure what. Adam and, and, and Bo laid out all these compelling reasons why both uh, you know, the United States companies want uh, Chinese investment in shale gas in particular and why Chinese companies desperately want to get into the market, get the technology, 
and, and move their capital. And then Professor Jiang comes in and reminds us, oh, by the way, there's people in Congress who are going to look at this very suspiciously and, and fearfully, I guess, in some ways. That's why the, the CNOC uh, Unicaw deal ultimately you know, didn't happen. Um, so I, I guess I'm left wondering how this dance kind of works out in, in the long run. Where, where do we really go from here in terms of you know, how much uh, the U.S. particular, I think Canada is maybe a different uh, question, but how much U.S. is going to be willing to uh, help China, uh, China move along in this type of energy development on conventional resources and that kind of thing? Thank you for your question. Um, I think you touched on a very important point, which is that um, the success of Chinese investment in the United States really is largely in our own hands. And I appreciated you bringing up the Unicall deal. Uh, Rhodium Group put out a, a paper last year uh, called An American Open Door, where we talked about uh, implications for the rising boom in Chinese investment in the United States. And one of the main policy conclusions that we came up with was that uh, we have to find some way to separate the national security um, um, analysis of incoming foreign direct in investment from uh, politics. Uh, we, we have no evidence to think that the CFIUS process hasn't been more than adequate to deal with incoming investments from China. And we feel strongly that because there's so many positive things that additional investment dollars from China can bring, that uh, we should be very committed to making sure that that process remains um, working and not infringed on by, uh, you know, flying by the seat of your pant political comments. Uh, so whether or not that happens is, is maybe a question that I, I don't have an answer to. But we are definitely of the opinion that that's what should happen if we want to have the most benefit from Chinese investment in the United States. Jennifer, okay, okay, and as, as, yeah. you, as she makes her way to the next yeah. questions with this corner, we definitely have to get Erica. So why don't we, we'll collect two questions right here and then, okay. Go. Yeah, I would jump in on here. Um, the question of, well, Adam, I, I have to say that you can't separate politics with the investment, especially in the energy sector. We need to form the politics of, how to say, accommodating the investment flow. Uh, and this two cannot be separated, and that's why this has to be a political economy and public policy issue. Uh, I partly, I think, we have learned from the Canadian experience over the years uh, that the Chinese investment is not that scary at all. I think uh, if you, many of you may not follow Canadian politics that much, this conservative government now has a majority. When they came to power in the spring of 2006, they didn't really want to do with anything with the Chinese. They didn't know China. They didn't never been to China. They thought this is a bunch of godless uh, communists and, uh, and there's nothing we need to deal with them about. Three years later, they became now in Siu since 2009. They've been uh, going to China a lot. So uh, we learned that, in, especially in North America, our rules are clear enough. I have not found a, you can cite me an incident, or a problem with the Chinese major investment in North America that do not follow our rules. Not the same can be said uh, in the case of Africa. I've done extensive research uh, on China's extractive industries work in Africa. I see different Chinas there. It's not a monolithic China, but by and by and large state-owned enterprises, large energy NOCs with a long-term goal of investing abroad, they do follow our rules, especially in North America. And I think uh, that's why our review ceiling has raised from 330 million to 1 billion. Below that, the government is no longer want to be bothered about. In part, they feel we can accommodate this without fear. That's one point. Second point, more importantly, people tend to think China is desperate for energy everywhere. They will scold the earth around the world and take energy, energy, any energy deals they want. They aggressively come, invest, overbid, and buy them. Not true. The Chinese are now in the, hands, in the sense that they're courted by the Americans, Canadians, Japanese, Europeans, Australians, Middle Easterners, all these people going to China to court the Chinese investment, actively seeking their cooperation, joint venture, injection of funds. Not a week go by. These senior VPs of NOC have told me, not a week go by, they don't receive phone calls, referrals, law firm offers, investment bankers. Many people want me to do this for them. I've been through this so much. 
So we tend to think this is the media question when they do interview. The first background line is, since China is so desperate for our energy, blah, 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 I said, stop there. China is not desperate for our energy. We are desperate for their capital to a certain extent. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, let's, Erica, we'll, and then, then behind you. We'll gather these couple questions here. Sure, Erica Downs, Brookings. My question is for Adam and for Bo. Um, in both of your presentations, you noted that one of the drivers of the Chinese NOC's investments in shale gas projects in the U.S. is to acquire technology and operational experience. But as you both noted, the way the recent investments by Sinook and Sinopec uh, in U.S. shale projects are structured um, is that they're structured in such a way so they're not getting technology, they're not getting um, operating experience. And so my question is, do you you see uh, these companies getting those things anytime soon, and what changes have to happen either on the Chinese side or on the U.S. side uh, to create a situation in which the Chinese NOCs might be able to get more of what they're looking for in North America? Thank you. Okay, and then pass it back, and we'll gather what, at least one more question. You guys, following up on technologies, um, oh, energy sector. Yeah. James are, yeah. Sang, yeah, I knew uh, IBM retired. Following up on technology question, the uh, energy sector is notorious for being uh, very low in, ener in research intens R and D intensity. Um, does do the Chinese, does the government, Chinese government, or the SOEs have any policies for support of uh, R and D in uh, extractive technologies? In particular, as DOE points out, the shale gas revolution had a lot to do with uh, research and development in horizontal drilling and stuff like that. Uh, do, does China believe that it should do this research in-house, or are they prepared to support uh, foreign uh, researchers? I'm all right. Go Make for it, Helen. Sure triplet. I'm Helen Rafael, Resources for the Future. I have a somewhat longer-term question, and that is: um, Isn't there a countervailing influence of the aging of the Chinese population, given the one-child policy, that? works against the uh, replenishment of urban workers that is coming from the countryside, so that in the not too distant future, there will be a shortage of workers and companies that have moved from America to China for the cheap labor will be moving back to North America and we will be needing ever so much more energy and it will be opportunities for Chinese investment in our increased production facilities. Okay. Um, so why don't we start with you two on that first question from Erica about, so they're not getting the technology, but uh, will they? What's going on? Okay, I'll lend you a quick response, then hand the time over to Bo Kong, because I feel like he's probably the bigger expert, expert in this field. Um, I think you identified a very important question. Uh, like you said, Chinese investment in oil has been very limited since the failed bid for Unicall, and whether or not they're available to really harness the technology that they're looking for in American firms is going to depend on what happens probably in the next few years. Uh, we're anticipating that uh, given Chinese continued interest, you know, several deals, I, I talked about something like $18.5 billion in oil and gas bids just in 2011 alone, that we will continue to see big bids. And as they feel around in the United States market, and feel more secure in uh, making bolder bids in the United States, we would expect you know, the, uh, the boldness, if you will, of these bids in American oil to continue to you know, rise over time. And you know, how we respond to that, again, kind of goes back to the, the earlier question. I, I'm not a fortune teller. I really don't know. But it's coming, I think. Um, oh, thank you, Eric, for, for your question. You asked a really uh, tough one. Um, it's her job. It's her job. It's a softball. It's a, actually, it's a very hard ball. Um, well, I think I've talked to some folks from Baker Hughes uh, and, and uh, other companies that have developed um, hydrofracturing technologies. And my sense is they understand this is their crown jewel, and they don't want to share it with the Chinese companies. And therefore, it's unlikely that the Chinese NOCs will get access to this technology in the U.S. However, um, technology is in the hands of people. So Chinese NOCs could potentially just buy the people that have the technologies. And so that's one possibility. If they can't do that, um, what are the alternatives? Um, one possibility is that they will open up more acreage to American companies that have the expertise to drill in China. And then over time, they get 
they get the spillover experience and knowledge to, to tap into the resources. But this is likely to take a much, much longer time, time frame. And moreover, I think um, the, the shale gas um, uh, licensing uh, has not been terribly smooth in China because of the, the jockeying and, and politics in China with regard to shale gas. So it's going to take a while. And, and, and just take a step back and you ask how important is this technology? Clearly it's very important. But assuming that the Chinese companies have this technology today, Will China replicate the same shale gas revolution the U.S. has? The answer is no, because even if the Chinese companies have the shale gas hydro fracturing technology and, and horizontal drilling technology, which they do have thanks to their coal bed methane you know, drilling, et cetera, activities, the, the issue is not the technology alone. The issue is how you integrate this technology in the way that that, that can tap into the resources in a very environmentally friendly fashion. And this goes back to Jennifer's uh, you know, uh, issue set of water, right? Water is a huge issue. The Ministry of Environmental Protection, for example, is very, very you know, concerned about how this whole you know, expansion takes place in China. That's why I think bureaucratically, they are still talking to each other at the central level about how to do this, really. Then going back to the gentleman's question about R&D, whether China should, think, should be thinking about doing its own R&D with regard to hydrofracturing technologies. I think I just came back from Shanghai Sunday, Sunday night, and I had some conversations with folks there. They all asked me the same question. You know, we understand shale gas revolution in, in the U.S. is real, but how long is this going to last? What does this mean for our energy strategy? Does that mean the U.S. will export to us as well? I said, no, 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 because the U.S. will only export to countries, you know, with which it has free trade agreement. Probably, you know, it's going to take 10 years and take your capital to help U.S. to export to other countries as well. So I think they have not decided to, you know, they haven't figured out a decision as to whether to make investment into their own hydrofracturing technologies in a massive scale. But I think that decision will be made in, the, in a couple of months. And once that decision is made, I, my sense is they probably will say, you know, after determining the situation, right, after determining that Chinese NOCs simply cannot uh, get access to technologies in the U.S., and, and it's going to take them a long time to get access to the technologies in China as well. And then they will say, you know what, this is real, this revolution is real, this is a game-changing event, and we have the resources that we have, we have to do it, we have to do it in a very, very environment-friendly way. So let's put massive amount of money into R&D. I think that's what it boils down to. I think, and, and soon, um, my, my colleagues at Circle of Blue were doing, some of you may know that we've been doing a project called Choke Point China, looking at how energy's impact, um, energy development is impacting water in China. My colleagues are in China right now, and they are asking a lot of these. We will have some reports updated on, on what's happening on shale gas in China. But I think, though, that, that he's right, though, that the partnerships, you know, the U.S. shale gas, U.S.-China shale gas initiative, <laughs> You know, has put out there politically that we are cooperating and encouraging shale gas development with China. So, but what that means for technology and whether they can even get at the shale, we'll know 2015 when that final assessment's done if it's if she's going to be as easy to get. Um, the manufacturing question. The manufacturing question. Can you I would answer this thing? Just jump, just a quick one, and then we're going to gather two questions in the back there. Okay. Uh, it would be a Stephen Jobs response to President Obama answer. Uh, those jobs are not coming back to the United States. If you look at the broader uh, historical trend that among the G8, even Brazil, the trend over decades and years is that manufacturing sectors in advanced industrial economies uh, go downwards in terms of share in GDP. So we rise, China, Japan substantially, India now high, but Japan is reducing as well. Uh, Japan, uh, China and India remain to be around 30% in manufacturing. Uh, but other countries decline to 20% around or below, and those are historical trends. The rise was due to the Industrial Revolution replacing the agrarian economy, and then you got into financial and service industry. So that trend cannot be reversed. So the issue now for U.S. and other countries, including Canada, is how do we uh, keep the edge in technology innovation and in those areas, technology is as a part of it. Just add one point. I don't want to think we should overplay 
the advantage of North American technology on energy. China has all the, the technologies in place, including uh, fraction, horizontal drilling. They use them, mm -hmm. but they don't have enough experience, not long enough. Also, the geological loca uh, okay, locations, uh, just as to add with Bob, Bob's point, ge geological location of China's shale reserve is quite far away. Infrastructure difficult, mm -hmm. water difficult. So those are actually uh, making it probably not potentially uh, uh, economical for a shale gas revolution in China. And if we have cheap LNG exporting to China in the future with all these 12 some projects going on in North America licensed, uh, China may not need to do large scale, uh, you know, costly and there's the uh, governance, shale development. The yeah. governance cost, I mean, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, they, they, that, they don't regulate right. Yeah. things under the ground. Yeah. Bit of a problem. Okay, some at the table. He's got the mic, so he's in control. Succinct question or comment, and then back to the back. We've got 15 minutes. Let's, I want to gather a few more questions here. Okay, quick, well, a quick comment is that just on the Unical issue, I think it's important to note that that never went through the U.S. CFIUS process. It, there was great political posturing, but there were a lot of dynamics where uh, Chevron made an alternative competing bid because of that confusion. But, but it never, the U.S. government never formally uh, prevented that. Uh, absolutely question, right, yeah. Que pardon me? That's absolutely right, yep. Yeah. Question um, is that we talk a lot about technology. The fundamental enabler to get technology to China and the one inhibitor is just the, the lack of, uh, of, of effectively protecting intellectual property. And what are the prospects? Because that actually impacts far beyond the energy business and really is seen as a major constraint across the board for investment in China. So interested on prospects for, uh, uh, for improving intellectual property issues. Okay, hold on, gentlemen. We're getting two more. So the, the gentleman with his hand up and then Connie across the aisle from him. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, Jim Hurd, Green Science Exchange. Um, as China gets closer and closer to announcing caps on carbon, many people think within the next six to eight months uh, on the seven largest cities in China, you know, I've uh, been doing meetings with China Beijing Environment Exchange, which is a leading SOE on this discussion. Won't that have a fundamental impact in the way coal is viewed and uh, renewable energy is viewed? Of course, uh, things won't happen fast. There'll be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, non-implementation. But <laughs> when that is announced, I think it'll have a fundamental uh, rudder shift on the discussion over the long run. And just was interested to hear uh, your impressions on that. Okay, and then hand it to there. There you go. Hi, uh, Conway Arwin with Interfax Energy. Um, I have two questions. One is whether China views securing LNG imports as a strategic energy imperative. And uh, for Canada, most of what uh, was talked about was oil exports to China. But does Alberta or Canada more broadly see opportunities in terms of exporting LNG to China in the future? We can work backwards. Want me LNG question first? Uh, <clears throat> I'm putting sure. that, that IPR one like way at the end because it's scary. Yes. Yeah, um, I think they they probably do have interest in LNG, um, and certainly um, China has been investing in shale gas plays in northeastern BC and Alberta, and uh, so there's an interest there. Whether it's a financial return interest in, you know, within Canada or longer term, they're hoping to bring LNG to China. I'm, I I can't be sure. I think the nearer term interest of theirs is is probably oil. Um, Certainly for Japan and Korea, it's LNG, so um, that's sort of the way we're prioritizing things right now. Um, I haven't, Wenran may have a better idea of how the Chinese view LNG from Canada, but uh, uh, I think right now our, our focus right now is pretty much on oil, and that's where most, much of the investment has been on in the oil side. Just to quickly add on the LNG issue, the Chinese want to have LNG from uh, uh, from Canada, also oil. We have uh, major Dandong ports come actually to us to propose to the provincial of Alberta, having a joint task force uh, in our last uh, month's meeting in Beijing, to uh, build the terminals to receive the potential oil sands crude uh, export. And China has been building LNG terminals along the west east coast for many years. And so the Chinese rationale is that they're going to need a lot of this, and they would like to uh, see as much uh, as possible. You know, China has difficulties in terms of 
uh, 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 importing. They're using very little, only 2 or 3% of the energy mix coming from uh, uh, gas, and they want to increase that share. But they face difficulties in negotiation with Russia, uh, which they signed a mega deal of 25 years supply uh, based on market price. But the Russians, you know, what is the market price? And they say the world price is market price. And the Chinese saying, well, our gas price piped from uh, Turkmenistan now being built uh, via Kazakhstan around seven, eight dollars. That should be the index price rather than twelve dollars. So they have tough negotiations. So look at this and say if in North America, now in Canada, the gas is under two dollars. Can you believe that? And so they're looking at us and look pretty good. And we have, Jeff, how many? We have three or four projects being approved and being uh, speed up and doing. So we're kind of in, comp in competition with the United States. U.S. has what? Eight projects being approved already for LNG export to Asia. Yeah. But I think Australia is already, they're already ahead of the game. And Australia. You know, South, 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 yeah, big Cir time. Cir yeah. Circle of Blue just did three stories on Australia's natural gas and coal exports. So it's kind of like a choke point Australia slash China um, study. But yeah, so I mean, but so Australia could be where to look to kind of see what's happening, you know, because I think that, and, and I think, you know, the Chinese want to build on that. Going. Australia and Qatar, these are com Qatar, competitors. Yes. So the way is maybe I'll, I'll stop here. That's okay. Uh, stop. Uh, yeah. Zhang and I will shut up quickly. Um, cap and trade. I think it's too early to talk about cap and trade. Yes, uh, we um, at Johns Hopkins Science just started a program, uh, a research program to look at uh, these seven pilot uh, cap and trade programs. So I will report back to you in a year. Um, because it's too early, these pilot programs um, just started a, couple, a month or so ago. We don't know exactly, you know, what the scope of activities are. But I can tell, give you a sense of the background. The backdrop is that uh, the Chinese government is fully aware of the growing pressure on on the country uh, to reduce uh, carbon footprint. Um, this carbon intensity, um, this this argument of carbon intensity, is no longer convincing. Uh, to the international community, particularly the, the, the U.S. and the Europeans, about what China ought to do. And therefore, this is, this is a way to sort of test, test the ability to reduce carbon emissions through market mechanism, i.e. through cap and trade. And note, note, note that the Chinese government has already launched a number of you know, aggressive uh, command and control measures to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, so, you know, our research actually looks at uh, whether how these two, you know, visible hand and invisible hand in interact with each other. Um, so I'll, I have to report back to you later on. Um, and feel free to, to email me if, you know, we can chat later on. And then IPR, I think this is an interesting question. Uh, it really, it's, we are at a crossroads um, on how, over how to think about IPR with regard to uh, the implementation, the protection of IPR in emerging economies such as China. Uh, on the one hand, you know, these countries have developed increasingly, increasing capabilities um, of, of doing their own R&D and producing their own advanced technologies. For example, China now leads the world in, in advanced coal, you know, fire, coal fire generation fleet, particularly super, ultra supercritical and supercritical and third generation nuclear technologies. On the other hand, um, these you know, Western companies continue to face uh, challenges uh, when, uh, engage, when they are engaged in technology transfers or when they, are, when they do businesses in China. And I think Westinghouse's example uh, is, is an interesting uh, case for us to think about the IPR regime. Westinghouse has agreed to transfer 100% of its, its Generation 3 AP1000 technology to China. Um, to, in order to access to the market. And under the notion that uh, technology is simply a large ticket you know, uh, item, and knowing that the Chinese companies will be able to indige indigenize this technology and Westinghouse has the ability to move up to the value chain to come up with the next generation of technology, next iteration of more competitive technologies. And then more companies you know, such as uh, Duke Energy uh, and other companies, Peabody, for example, in the U.S., have moved toward the direction of, of working together with Chinese companies to co-develop, co-develop mm -hmm. you know, co a, a new next generation of environmental 
uh, and uh, environmental friendly and climate friendly technologies. So this might be an interesting model here for us to think about this co this partnership, uh, you know, in generating technologies. And then I think, you know, of course, the American companies actually have become much, much more smarter, much, much more sophisticated in protecting their technologies. They have learned to unbundle their technologies. They have learned to, you know, sort of appoint different people to protect their technologies. So I think there is a progress. And, and mo moreover, just to conclude, I think as Chinese companies increase in their capabilities of producing their own technology, they have more and more incentive to protect these technologies. So they have vested interest in protecting and promoting the, the, the proper you know, application of these technologies. You know, look back, Japan didn't become a, a good corporate, you know, a good you know, citizen in protecting technologies in a, in a national system overnight. South Korea didn't become a good corporate, you know, good global citizen in, in protecting technology overnight. And I, neither will China be in that case. But, but we are seeing, we're seeing, I think we're seeing positive sort of, you know, trends uh, that give us some hope. Well, there's also the, the U.S.-China, the 2009 obama who agreements that created the U.S. Clean Energy Research Center. There's also joint technology development. A man in a purple shirt caught my attention here. Yes, thank you very much. A question uh, who for... Who are you? So sorry. Oh, pardon me. Uh, my name is Raymond Barrett, and I'm with Deal Reporter. Uh, a question maybe for Jeff and Adam. Is there any way that maybe you'd be able to compare and contrast the, say, approval process for, for these investments in Canada and the U.S.? Because we have the, say, uh, and how differences in the approval process might affect investment or, or affect its acquisition. And but, yeah, so, so basically, I'm not too sure who's best to do it, but as in basically how the process works in Canada versus the U.S., and whether or not maybe the federal state kind of dynamic in Canada makes the process smoother rather than compared to the, f say, federal state uh, operation in the U.S. So, okay, good. My yeah, we might have to wrap up because we only have a couple of minutes. So we might that might be the last question. I okay, if we could start here because I don't, I'm not familiar with the approval processes in the U.S. And yeah, I well, no, you, yeah, you do the can. Yeah, but on in Canada, I think I, I touched on this in my presentation, but. There's a, uh, the, uh, with the federal government, through the Investment Canada Act, um, they review uh, projects um, that are significant, and right now the threshold for review is $330 million. As I said, it's moving up over four years to um, $1 billion. And so they basically apply some criteria. There's a net benefit test, which looks at a number of factors, but essentially is this investment judged to be of net benefit to Canada on, you know, sort of economic, technological, and other factors. Um, that additional criteria I mentioned on, on national security, uh, is there a potential threat to national security? That's also one of the criteria, although that particular one is not very well defined. Um, and so, um, but as I said, we haven't seen very many uh, rejections at all. There have only been two, and in fact, most applications um, sail through um, without a problem. And the two rejections were on, on what basis? Like well, one was uh, on, te on technology, uh, the possible loss of critical technology to, to Canada. Uh, in the case of the McDonald uh, Detweiler, uh, deal and uh, the other one was, I think, a net benefit test failure on the in the case of Potash Corporation uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, that was where BHP Billiton made uh, an offer to take that company over. At the provincial level, um, there are there aren't actually currently any formal criteria used to review investments in the energy sector. Uh, along those kinds of lines, but those are things that are currently under review and discussion in w within Alberta, at least, and uh, will require our political leaders to to make some um, some decisions about very soon. But um, uh, so I can't say one way or another whether there will be, um, but um, um, certainly, um, you know, that's part of our objective in the dialogue with China, is to ensure that. You know, having this this ability to have a discussions with China on an ongoing basis, uh, talking about uh, activities within Alberta, within Canada, is going to help us to sort of manage expectations and ensure that 
you know, they continue to play by the rules that you know, we're achieving the objectives that we set uh, both within Canada and in China and so on. So, um, and Adam, I can talk just oh, briefly about here. the CFIUS process. Um, uh, the review process in the United States obviously is a little bit different than Canada. As far as I'm aware, we have no meaningful um, net benefit test that we apply here in the United States. Uh, but the CFIUS process has been around since 1975 and uh, is is concerned primarily with uh, national security. Um, they do not review greenfield investments into the United States, which I think is important because only uh, only large multinational firms tend to, uh, well, first of all, merger and acquisitions deals in the United States tend to be larger and tend to be more sensitive. And so um, greenfield investment in the United States you know, happens all the time. People build manufacturing facilities, sales offices, um, any other number of investment operations in the United States without even being reviewed by CFIUS. And then even mergers and acquisitions deals, um, not all of them are reviewed by CFIUS. So to, to compare the two would be difficult. To say if Unicall had happened in Canada, would it have passed? Is, is, I don't think that's a question I would even be comfortable answering because the systems are sufficiently different and there's really no way to compare the investments that have come to the United States and Canada and to say if they would have been different. Have any of the Chinese energy investments gone through this? The, the, some of them that you had listed, the CFIUS? Every, um, every major merger and acquisition deal that comes into the United yes. States, um, I'm not sure if they have, but they, they are allowed to voluntarily um, submit uh, for review to the CFIUS process. And if they do not voluntarily, the CFIUS committee has the authority to go back and, uh, um, under their own authority, initiate an investigation. I'm not sure if those energy firms were reviewed by CFIUS, but the fact that they are invested here means that if they were, they passed. And that's a federal level. Federal but at level, the state, yes. a lot of, I mean, every major, almost every major state government has like offices in China and is tr also trying to court this investment. State governments are very pro China investment. Um, I, I, I think uh, I've, I've done a count, and there are at least 36 states that operate uh, investment offices in China, if I, if I remember correctly. And, uh, but as far as I'm aware, there is no state level review process in the United States. Just bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Yeah. All right. So, I like being true. You, most of you arrived here at 9 o'clock and we end at 11. Um, to, uh, just a note that for the coal question, we're having a, we're, ha we're, we're delving, I love coal. July 24th, we got two Chinese coal experts coming. You just come on and we'll, we'll talk coal cap till the cows come <laughs> home. Um, any final Canada announcements, next meetings you want to? Arctic again, July 12th. July 12th. Arctic Energy. Arctic, July 12th, Arctic Energy, cooling down in July, <laughs> and heated up with coal on the 24th with the China Environment Forum. If you're not on our mailing list, for goodness sake, grab one of the interns or assistants or Dave or me, give us your card because belong to the family. One more time, applause for the speakers here, please.